So during my teens, I'd often ask my mom, not my dad, who happens to be here, uh, I would ask her, what is the purpose of life? And she would never give me an answer that I was all that satisfied with. Now, to her credit, I'd usually ask when she was busy with something else, like washing dishes or folding laundry. And so she would usually quip, the purpose of life is for you to clean up after your own mess. (laughs) But sometimes, if she gave a more honest answer, she would say something like, the purpose of your life is to live your life, love. Now... She was admittedly a bit bewildered about why this question caused me so much angst, and it's because she underestimated how emo I am. (laughs) But I kept asking the question, and I kept searching, and if someone in my early spiritual pursuits had told me, look, the meaning of life, what you're looking for is a covenant, I may have been bewildered like my mom. And if they had explained covenants to me, I would have scoffed. I wouldn't be able to understand how things like circumcision and the sacrifice of animals, let alone the sacrifice of the Son of God, had anything to do with spirituality. You know, I had totally dedicated myself to more esoteric things like chanting and meditation and yoga and meeting shamans and reading the Bhagavad Gita and popular New Age books and whatnot. Covenants? Covenants were not on my radar. And yet, I've come to see, and today I believe, that true spirituality is covenant spirituality. And more specifically, that the purpose of life is the new covenant. The purpose of life is the new covenant. So as we continue in our series, Brick and Mortar, today we're going to look at how the new covenant is essential to our foundations in Christ. And if the idea of covenants is foreign to you, or if you're like, I don't really see how that could possibly be the meaning of life, I just want to invite you to press in. It takes a bit of work to see what's going on in the covenants, but if you do, you will find true spirituality. You will find the purpose of life. And so this morning, I have three things we're going to consider together. Uh, Covenants, broken covenants, and the new covenant. So let's begin with our first point Covenants, if you do have a Bible, open it back up to Jeremiah 31, which was just read for us. Um, This is one of the most definitive passages on the new covenant in the entire canon of the scriptures. So Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 31, it'll be on the screen behind me as well. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. But before we can talk about this new covenant, we at least need to get some understanding about covenants as a whole. What are they and what's the heart of them? A covenant is uh, essentially a set terms of agreement. It's kind of like a contract. And in the scriptures, a covenant can be between two people, like Jonathan and David, for example. It can be between nations And it's most often between God and his people. But a covenant is not entirely like a contract because most contracts are thing-oriented. So you might sign a contract for a mortgage and then you get the thing, a house. Or you might sign a contract for a job and then you get the thing, you know, a paycheck. You might sign a contract to be friends with Alistair, Bub, but the small print is now you have to live in unaffordable Vancouver for the rest of your life. You're welcome. (laughs) But a covenant, the difference between a contract, which is thing-oriented, and a covenant is a a covenant is always person-oriented. It's primarily about the people involved, and a covenant is established out of a desire for a relationship that deepens loyalty. And so marriage is best understood as covenant. You know, the vows to have and to hold from this day forward for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish, to death do us part, or dolphins divide us according to God's holy ordinance. You know, these are promises that a couple enters into together that sets the stage for the rest of their lives. And the hope is over time, as they fulfill these vows, the promises actually shape and change their lives. These vows are actually person oriented. And so in the same way, God's covenant is person oriented. God and his people met, they made mutual vows and promises to one another, and they established consequences for anyone who'd break the covenant. And here's the thing, 
You know, the people always, always, always get the better end of the deal. Think of it like getting an allowance as a kid. You and your parents enter into an agreement. You do some chores, chores like cleaning up after your mess, tidying your room around the house that your parents pay for and you live in for free. And at the end of it, your parents give you their money. Something is not balanced in this equation. The parents often give more than what they receive and they do so gladly. And it's the same with God's covenant. He gives so much more than he receives back and he does so gladly. God's covenants are people-oriented, and he always makes this promise within the covenant. He says, I will be your God, and you will be my people. He says that to Abraham when he establishes the covenant. He says it to Moses when he establishes the covenant. He even says it to Jeremiah when he establishes the promise of the new covenant. Every covenant with God is about this fundamental promise. This is the heartbeat of the covenant. I will be your God, you will be my people. It's people-oriented. But as you've probably picked up, covenants are also promise-based. God promises to be our God. Promises will be his people. Promises that as a result, our life and the world around us will change if he's our God and we are his people. And so, for example, God makes a covenant with Abraham. He promises to make a great nation out of him and that his descendants will be innumerable as the stars. And God reaffirms this covenant with Moses and the people of Israel at Mount Sinai once he had delivered them out of slavery in Egypt and promises them they'll have a land flowing with milk and honey. And once again, God reaffirms this covenant with King David and promises that he will now establish Israel as a nation with an everlasting throne. And so the heartbeat of the covenant is people-oriented, it's promise-based. God will be our God, we will be his people, and this will change our lives. But the expectations around the covenant is mutual loyalty and fidelity and love as God fulfills the promises and we're faithful to him. So that's covenants. So let's turn to our second point, though, broken covenants. Turn again to Jeremiah 31, uh, verses 31 through 32. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. So God promises that there will be a new covenant because the old covenant is broken. And the problem with the old covenant, of course, was not God. God is not the one who breaks covenants. God describes himself here as a faithful husband. He's united to his people in love and fidelity, but the problem is the people. I took them by the hand. It's this beautiful, intimate, poetic way of making clear that the people of God were utterly helpless until God delivered them personally out of their slavery in Egypt and into the promised land. But almost as soon as this deliverance took place... The people broke the covenant. They couldn't be faithful just waiting for Moses to return with the Ten Commandments without making it a golden calf, an idol. And again and again and again and again and again throughout the entire history of the Old Testament, the people break the covenant. God calls himself a husband. He's a husband to his people. He says this to Jeremiah. So it should be of little surprise that One of the most common metaphors for this infidelity of God's people throughout Scripture is adultery. And nowhere is this more powerfully conveyed than the book of Hosea. Hosea is a prophet, and God instructs him to marry a woman named Gomer. And God told the prophet this, Go marry a promiscuous woman and have children with her. For like an adulterous wife, this land is guilty of unfaithfulness to the Lord. And Hosea goes and does it, which one just shows Hosea is way more faithful than any of us. Not the command I would want to follow. And Hosea, he marries Gomer. They have three children together, but then she commits adultery and leaves Hosea for other lovers. But then God speaks to Hosea again, and despite Gomer's unfaithfulness, God instructs Hosea to go and find Gomer to pay off her debts to her other lovers 
and to commit his love and faithfulness to her again and bring her home. And so Hosea's life is this prophetic sign of God's relationship with Israel, God's relationship with his people. God has been a faithful husband to his people, but they've been unfaithful. They've broken the covenant. And so here's the thing we need to understand. If God took his ancient people Israel to court, so to speak, if they went to trial and faced up their terms and conditions of the covenant, they'd be in breach of contract. God could cancel the covenant, and he would have good reason to do so. He would be just in doing so. But instead, in ways that surpass Hosea, God continues to love and pursue his people. And so he says, the days are coming when I'll make a new covenant. So despite all this failure and adultery and unfaithfulness, God makes a set of even better promises. He makes even better promises, even though the people have fallen short, even though the people have broken the covenant. Now, I understand. You know, covenants, they're foreign to many of us. If you're just exploring faith or spirituality, if you're starting to just get a sense of, like, who is Jesus, you might be thinking, well, I was never in a covenant with God to begin with. I was never in this old covenant. I wasn't bound to these promises. I didn't break any of them. And this might be true. You know, in fact, most of us in this room did not grow up within the Old Covenant unless you grew up in a Jewish household. And even so, that doesn't mean we're not among the covenant-breaking people of God. Paul puts it this way in Romans. When Gentiles, so this is a way of saying everybody who isn't Jewish, when Gentiles who do not have the law, the law being the, the, the rules and way of the Old Covenant, so when Gentiles who do not have the law do by nature things required by the law, they're a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts and their consciences also bearing witness and their thoughts sometimes accusing them and other times even defending them. So the basis of the covenant is, I will be your God, you will be my people, and so you need to live and act and behave as my people, and to guide them, God gave them the law, the Ten Commandments, which then also became the Torah, a set of 613 more interpretations of those commandments. And Paul says, even outside of this covenant and law, our conscience, by nature, is covenantal. You need to understand that. Our conscience, by nature, is covenantal. It accuses us and defends us by an knowing of what is right and wrong inherently. Now we can blunt that conscience, we can try to ignore it, but we all have that experience where our conscience accuses or defends us in matters great and small. And the story of Scripture, friends, it provokes us to acknowledge that we would be among those who've broken the covenant, even if we we're never in the covenant to begin with, because our God-given conscience accuses us. Even if we don't know the law or the terms and the conditions of the covenant, we are the type of people who would intentionally or unintentionally break the covenant because we're Gomer, we're not Hosea. We sin. That's the problem. The law provokes our sin. We can't do it. I just read uh, a bunch of Deuteronomy yesterday. It was like four or five times I realized like, I would be sentenced to death. Like, I'm not kidding. Like, four or four, five times, just in my reading of Deuteronomy, Alistair Stern, you die. And, like, we can kind of, like, be like, oh, yeah, that's Old Testament. Like, yeah, I'm glad I live now. We sin. Sin, it's, it's gossiping despite the conviction that you should keep your mouth shut. It's neglecting to provide for or care for someone because you don't want to be bothered and inconvenienced or, more simply, you just don't like them. It's indulging in pornography or uh, other matters of sexual desire again and again and again, despite your conscience telling you this isn't in alignment with the ways of God. It's stealing what isn't yours and justifying it. It's lying to save face. We all know what it is to violate our conscience, whether or not we're aware of God's laws. And so what did it look like for the last time, the last time you violated your conscience? Matters big or small, we all do it. All of us, every single one of us, according to Scripture, then accumulate a burden of sin, a debt of sin that is insurmountable for us to deal with. 
We fall short more times than we can identify. We live for ourselves more than we live for God. And so we hurt others in doing so, and we're hurt by others. And this is why we confess week after week in our liturgy, we have sinned in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. And while our infidelity to God and his covenant and even to our own conscience is to our shame, a healthy shame, it's not to our condemnation. Because God does not cease to love Gomer. God does not cease to love his unfaithful people or those outside of the covenant either. And we can say this because God promises a new covenant. He doesn't get out of the contract, even though he has every right to. Instead, he makes a set of even better promises. And so let's move to our last point, the new covenant. All is not lost. The people break the covenant, but that isn't the thrust of Jeremiah 31. Uh, We read in verses 31 and verses 33 through 34, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. This is the covenant I'll make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I'll put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they'll all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. The days are coming declares the Lord. The new covenant is on its way. And then centuries after making this promise to the prophet Jeremiah, on the evening of his crucifixion, Jesus gathers with his closest followers for a meal, what we now call the Last Supper. And we read about it in Matthew. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, All of you, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. A few weeks ago, I said that the cross is fundamentally a revelation of God's love. Whatever else it may be, whatever else it may accomplish, the cross is fundamentally a revelation of God's love. It is God's love on display. But what is this love doing? It is establishing the new covenant. So we can also say the cross is fundamentally about the new covenant, whatever else may be transpiring on the cross. And there are several promises to the new covenant, and I just want to consider two together this morning. And the first promise of the new covenant is this, the law will be written on our hearts through the Spirit. God says to Jeremiah, I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And he also says something similar to the prophet Ezekiel. God says, I'll give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Now, this isn't like the matrix. You know, you don't wake up like Neo and say like the Christian equivalent of I know Kung Fu, which I'm guessing is like I know Bible. So what is this about then? How is the law written on our hearts? From the depths of our hearts, the promise is this. We're going to know God and follow God. That God will put his own spirit in us to create desires in us and also give us the ability to carry them through. That will be invited by our own effort as well to cooperate with the spirit of the living God dwelling in us. You see, the problem with the first covenant wasn't God or his promises. It was the fickle nature of our hearts. We couldn't hold up our end of the bargain. We couldn't adhere to the deal. We we couldn't just apply ourselves fully to the external direction and rules. But now in the new, from the depths of our being, God is going to empower us to know him and be able to follow him through a living relationship. William Barclay puts it like this. Under the new covenant, the promise is that people would obey God, not because the terror of punishment, but because they love God in their hearts. 
People would obey God, not because the law ordered them unwillingly to do so, but because the desire to obey him was written on their hearts. And what a fundamental shift. What we're told is that the Spirit is how our hearts and our wills and our desires will be changed in such a way that we don't pursue God out of obligation or pressure or fear or guilt or a need for his approval or thinking that we have to somehow gain his acceptance and favor. Because in the new covenant, because of what Christ has accomplished for us, the Spirit of the living God comes to dwell in us and write his laws and ways in our lives, and enable us day by day to walk with him. And this transformation, it flows from another promise of the new covenant, the second promise I want to look at together. The permanent forgiveness of sins. The permanent forgiveness of sins. Which is why I think anyone who keeps coming back to worship the living God, this is the promise that draws us in. The permanent forgiveness. Forgiveness of sins. The writer Brendan Manning, uh, and he's amazing. If you've never read anything by Manning, you should check it out. But he tells the story of a woman who had been having visions of Jesus. And the local archbishop comes to find out more about this woman having visions of Jesus. And he's a little skeptical because we can't have some woman having visions about Jesus now, can we? And so the archbishop goes and visits her and he says, have you been having visions of Jesus? And she replies, yes. And the archbishop says, here's what I want you to do. The next time you have a vision of Jesus, I want you to ask him a question for me. And she said, okay, what's the question? He said, I want you to ask Jesus, the last time I went to confession, what sins did I confess? And she says, okay. And so time goes by and he hears that she's been having visions of Jesus again. So he goes down to visit her and he says, have you been having visions of Jesus? And she says, yes. And he says, did you ask him my question? And she says, yes. And she takes him by the hands and she says, I asked Jesus, what did he confess the last time he went to confession? What were the sins? And she looked him in the eyes and she said, here's what Jesus said to me. I don't remember. I don't remember. As Jeremiah prophesied, I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Really? I mean, our sins won't be remembered. The hurts we inflict on others, the gossip, the quiet judgment, the pride and superiority we feel, the cheating, the affairs, the unethical shortcuts we take at work, the white lies, the big lies, the immorality, the the hatred, the things we've intentionally done, all the things we're not even aware that we've done. How can God not remember these things? And what about the bigger sins of society, moving beyond ourselves, people who abuse others in the name of God, the pillaging of our earth for our own benefit, the blind eye we all turn toward the modern day slavery issues or sex trafficking or systemic racism, the genocide. I mean, how will God not remember these things? How is that even possible? One of my favorite shows of all time is House. Any Hugh Laurie fans here, House? A couple of us. And there's this episode where House and his team, they treat a woman with hyperthymesia. And it's a rare but real condition of possessing an extremely detailed autobiographical memory. Think of like a photographic memory, but with perfect recall. And she can recall every single moment of every single day, and she remembers everything, which sounds really cool until you realize she remembers everything. And so the heart of the issue, the focus, is exploring why she's unable to forgive her sister. And this is something she says in the show. It's common sense. It's simple math. She hurt me more than she helped me. Most people edit their memories. They add small little lies so they don't have to face the truth. But I can't do that. She can't forgive because she remembers. See, our memories, it makes it hard for us to forgive. Our inability to forget past traumas and disappointments and hurts, combined with the way our brain actually stores memories, like we remember things, but then we also feel the things again that are attached to those memories. It makes it difficult to forgive. From our own experience, we know that our memories make it harder to forgive. 
So how can the God who remembers everything actually forgive us? You know, our memories, they're partial and incomplete, and our perspective is subjective, but God sees it all, everything. Everything is spread before him. How can God remember everything, all that we've done and left undone, and still forgive? Jesus holds a cup of wine and he says, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the forgiveness of sin. God does not turn a blind eye to our sins or the horrific realities of this world. Instead, Jesus, the Son of God, voluntarily pays the penalty for them on the cross. His body absorbs our sins and all the world's injustice. And the slate then is wiped clean once and for all. And as a result, there is nothing to remember. Because the cross, we could say, is the annulment of our sin. Unlike divorce, when annulment is retroactive, when a marriage is dissolved through annulment, it means it's erased from the very beginning. So theoretically, it never happened, except for the fact that we can't forget it. But in a far superior way than this, Jesus has annulled the sins of the world. This annulment is not bound by time. Yes, Jesus died within history, but the annulment of our sins is past, present, and future. And because Jesus died once and for all time. The conviction of the church throughout the ages is that his sacrifice was all sufficient, entirely complete, and totally comprehensive. This is why Jesus, the Son of God, God in the flesh, can say to us with truth and grace, I do not remember your sins. I do not remember your sins. The penalty has been paid. The world is being remade because sin is no longer held against us. They're remembered no more. So the question is, what does the new covenant mean practically for us? I just have a quick points here. You know, for anyone who's in Christ, the promises of the new covenant, they're yours doesn't matter what you brought into this room today. Your sins are completely and entirely forgiven. It doesn't mean you're off the hook for the consequences of your sins. It doesn't mean you have to do the hard work of reconciling uh, for the people that you've hurt by your sins. But your sins are forgiven. And the spirit of the living God dwells in you, enabling you and giving you the desire to live out his will, to walk in a new way. And the love of God on display in Christ spurs you on. That's what it means to be a person of the new covenant. And if you're not among the people of the new covenant, you need to know, like the invitation is generous and wide. And the invitation is simple. Come to Christ in faith. Be baptized. Find your seat at this table. Be among the family of God. This is why we say become a disciple of Jesus. Another way of understanding that is become an apprentice of Jesus. Become a lifelong learner of his ways and over time actually become more and more like your master. That's the invitation. And there's two practical implications for those of us who are among the people of God in the new covenant. And we're going to look at these in much more detail in the future in this series But I just want to touch on them briefly this morning. First, we adopt and prioritize the core practice of the new covenant, the table, communion. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus took bread and wine and he said, this is my body and my blood. It establishes this new covenant. Do this in remembrance of me. And so week after week, we have communion here, not just out of empty Ritual, but because in a very real way, when we come to this table, we're encountering Jesus Christ. And this is a practice that defines who we are and why we exist. God will be our God and we will be his people. And we experience that through a humble meal. Through a meal. And this brings us to our second implication that if you're among the people of God, you have to be radically committed to one another. C.S. Lewis, I want to thank Preston in advance for telling me this this week. I didn't know it before this week. But C.S. Lewis, 
describes spiritual friendship not as sitting face to face with one another, but shoulder to shoulder so that you can look together at something else. Spiritual friendship then is being shoulder to shoulder and gazing upon Christ and seeking his ways together. And this should be the nature of our life in the new covenant. We're shoulder to shoulder with one another. We're adopted into the family of God. And together then, the scriptures say, we're brothers and sisters, whether we like it or not. We're brothers and sisters. This means we cannot reduce our relationships down to relationships of convenience or preference. Stop hanging out with people who only look like you. Stop hanging out with people who are only the same age of you. Start hanging out with some children, as I've been saying. Start hanging out with some people older. Start hanging out with people who have different political beliefs than you. Why? Because shoulder to shoulder, you're gazing upon Christ. And that is more important than all these other things. And that can establish relationships you could never imagine. I am friends with people that I would never be friends with outside of Christ. And they're beautiful, and they're amazing, and they bless my life. And I want to be honest, this takes commitment, it takes effort, and patience, forgiveness, and bearing with one another, and struggling, and joy, and celebration, and tears, and hurt, and reconciliation. It takes an intentional commitment to show up, and keep trying, and to make it a priority, and to fumble forward with grace, knowing that as brothers and sisters, we're imperfect, but we're still family, standing shoulder to shoulder, gazing upon Christ. And so what I, want to, I just want to ask, is your participation in the life of this community motivated by the new covenant, or is it motivated by whether or not it's convenient for you to show up today? Do you show up on Sunday, and do you draw near to this table, or your community group, community group or in the relationships in this room, do you do it when it suits you, when it's convenient, when you can fit it into your schedule among many priorities? Or do you say, no, God has promised, I will be your God, you will be my people. And so it is not negotiable for you. Like you need to be among God's people, as fickle as we are, to draw near to this table, to make this a priority. Not out of the guilt of attendance or to earn a gold star, but because Jesus said, come, draw near, eat this bread and wine, participate in my presence with the body. What motivates you? The promises of the covenant or the convenience and scheduling of your life? Are you here when it's convenient to show up? Or are you here because it's necessary and needed and beautiful and you know that it is part of the true purpose of life? We're going to dig into all of that later in the series. As new covenant people, we draw near to the table and we draw near to one another. So here's my hope. If some emo kid teenager comes to you one day, or a friend, co-worker, family member, and they say, what is the meaning of life? What is the purpose of life? I hope with conviction you can say, the new covenant. The new covenant. And I hope you can explain covenant spirituality simply. God has made an unbreakable promise. I will be your God. You will be my people. And we believe that God's love is on display in his son, Jesus Christ, and that his death on the cross was a revelation of God's love that enacts a whole set of new promises that in Christ our sins are permanently forgiven, we're filled with his spirit, that as imperfect as we are, we can actually be transformed. That's covenant spirituality. That's the purpose of our life here on earth. Let's pray.